Hi guys, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, and welcome to yet another episode of uh, Own Thy Audience. Today we have with us uh, Mark Randall. Hi, Mark. Hi, how are you? Good, good, thanks. Uh, Mark is uh, country head for Australia and New Zealand for, uh, for WP Engine. Uh, WP Engine, as most of, you, most of us know, is now, uh, is now literally a, a, a household name in the tech industry. Right. Uh, they sort of pretty much uh, set the benchmarks when it comes to performance, uh, right? Uh, and as and uh, uh, and uh, and today's conversation will sort of essentially revolve around uh, you know the 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 one topic that marketers and even developers obsess about, which is site performance. Right? For some, it means speed. For some, it means SEO rankings. But then uh, what does not change is that it is now a mission critical metric. Uh, it's, a, it's a mission critical uh, thing for businesses uh, in 2020, right? Uh, with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Mark. Mark, over to you. Great, and thanks for having me and thanks everyone for uh, attending. I hope you're all keeping healthy um, at this time. So, um, let, let me let me um, break into it and give a quick introduction to myself. So, as you heard, I'm the country manager for WP Engine in Australia, New Zealand, and uh, we also look after um, APAC as well um, as part of our, our remit. So, before WP Engine, I've been with the company for about three and a half years. I had a long career in cloud managed services, hosting, and telecom. So. As you can appreciate, probably from that, uh, I've had exposure to you know the different layers of the stack that uh, lead to good site performance along the way. Kind of started very much at the telco and the infrastructure level, now moves sort of more up into the application uh, space. So I'm not a super technical person, um, but uh, I certainly started out on the tech side before moving over to the business side. And, you know, hopefully what I can do is take a big and complex area like site performance and make it easier to digest uh, if you're a business owner or a marketer in particular. So that's that's my goal here today. So hopefully I, I, I achieve that. Uh, last thing, fun fact about me, I am a Liverpool Football Club fan and very excited about winning the Premier League for the 19th time very soon, hopefully tomorrow. So quick background on WP Engine. Uh, as you heard, we're um, you know, quite a big organization these days. Uh, we have customers in over 130 countries. We have over 130,000 customers and over 600,000 websites uh, run on our platform globally. And fun fact for you is that 5% of the web touches one of our hosted properties every day. Uh, so that's our, our fun fact. We've also got data centers all around the world. So we've got offices in the locations you can see on the map, uh, but we also have data centers uh, across Europe, uh, America, and also Asia. So what we're gonna talk about today, and as I mentioned, it's a big topic, so there's a fair amount of content that I'm gonna try and get through, albeit from a high level, uh, but we're gonna focus on why speed is important. Firstly, uh, a lot of you will probably have an intrinsic understanding of that, but hopefully there's some new data points in there for you. I'm gonna talk about how you go about measuring it, uh, I'm going to talk about the concept of performance budgeting as well, which is something that Google actually introduced uh, to our customers at our last Australian summit, which is a, a, a super interesting concept. And then finally, I'm going to go through the actual drivers of performance. So what are the different pieces of the layer cake that you need to focus on in order to deliver a good site performance and a good experience to users? And then I'll obviously summarize that with some takeaways at the end. So starting off with why speed is important. Uh, this is what, um, you know, Google looks at. So, you know, they look at many factors when they're looking at ranking sites, including, you know, words of your query, relevance, and all importantly, the usability of your pages. And, um, you know, it's a fact that since July 2018, so going back two years now, speed update bots have had a vendetta against slow sites. Right, so you know there's irrefutable uh, evidence that slow sites are going to harm your SEO, that is your both your AdWords and your natural search uh, ranking results. 
In terms of how important site speed is, uh, there's numerous data points on this that all give a consistent answer. But you know, in summary, you could expect a one second improvement on your load time to lead to 11% more page views, 16% increase in customer satisfaction, and 7% gain in site conversions. And you know, this is um, you know super important. Essentially, what we're seeing is that site performance is becoming either a competitive advantage if you have it, or a competitive disadvantage if you don't. Right, so it requires focus and it requires discipline. Um, it's not just an afterthought or something that you check, you know, when you think about it or, you know, once or twice a year. I'll give you some more specific examples of this. So um, the BBC, the national broadcaster in the UK lost 10% of their users per second of load time. That's, that's their stats. Uh, Amazon have estimated that they've increased their conversions by 7% per second with reduced load time and mobile conversions are reduced by 20% per second, according to Google. All right, so here, there, there's some of the data points on this just to, to kind of back that up. Uh, another aspect to think about in this mix as well is that, you know, internet expectations are changing all the time. So WP Engine, every year we release uh, research on what different generations expect from their digital experiences. And we work with an organization known as the Center for Generational Kinetics in order to help us study uh, that from year to year across Gen Z, across millennials, across Gen X, and across baby boomers. And you know what these surveys and this research shows irrefutably is that uh, the younger generations who are becoming the biggest uh, consumers over the next five or 10 years have the least tolerance for uh, slow sites and the highest dependency on, um, on their digital experiences. So some data points around this, 55% of them can't last more than five hours without the internet, but 49% of, millenn um, of millennials can't last more than five hours, but 22% of baby boomers can go a week or more, right? So you've got these big differences, but the emerging consumer in from these younger Gen Z generation uh, is you know, demanding uh, an always on digital experience and a very high level of immediacy. So, you know, they have expectations that, you know, the content they want is going to be available to them there and then. The average uh, attention span for uh, Gen Z is only seven seconds versus 12 seconds for, for millennials, right? So these, these attention spans are dropping. If you're not there, if you're not serving them with the content they want, when you want it, they're going to switch and they're going to find that, that content or that, uh, that service somewhere else. Some more insights that came out of this study. So, you know, 68% of Gen Z also believes that websites will know what you, you're looking for before you tell them. Um, you know, 50% of them will stop visiting a website if it doesn't anticipate what they need, liked, or wanted. And 60% believe that websites will become more human. So why is this important site um, performance, you might ask? Well, what this talks to is that digital experiences are becoming more personalized. They're gonna become more dynamic. So instead of having one website that serves a million people, you're gonna have a million websites, each one of them customized and personalized to the user that's, that's accessing that site. And that places a huge amount of computational intensity on the site, uh, which puts pressure on performance. It's the, the more you do with this site, the more dynamic it is, the more it slows down. So you've got these, you know, the forces going in different directions of higher expectations for quick, uh, you know, immediate access to content, but the type of experience that, that they want to consume are so much more dynamic and interactive that it's harder and harder to get that content and to generate that experience for them quickly. Another data point on this. So every generation apart from Gen Z uses, views the internet primarily for inf as being a tool for accessing information. Gen Z views it as a tool for entertainment. So, you know, fundamentally the way that they view the internet and its prime purpose is different to previous generations. So again, as digital, uh, you know, you know, people in the digital space and as marketers, 
we need to start thinking about how we rethink our digital experiences and our websites to be entertaining, how we incorporate more video content, again, how we make them more uh, interactive, more fun, more dynamic. Uh, so again, another data point showing the challenges that we have uh, in both meeting the expectations of, for performance as well as the expectations for functionality in the future. Finally, on top of all this, we have the impacts of COVID-19, of course. And, you know, the outbreak over the last three months and the, you know, lockdown orders have seen a massive increase in internet traffic and consumption globally, uh, around 30% on average and you know have really accelerated digital transformation initiatives you know we've seen this at wp engine with you know the number of new projects that are coming you know to us um, for companies looking to you know either get online for the first time or if they were online turn brochureware sites into e-commerce sites or membership sites um, and to deliver you know more enriched experiences to their users so you know what you know took maybe 10 or 20 years to evolve before has probably been matched by what's happened in the last three months. So, you know, the bottom line, the takeaway from this is, you know, this is kind of a wake up call, right? We need to accelerate reimagining our businesses in a more digital way. And we need to put performance at the heart of that to ensure that we remain competitive against uh, the people that we're out there trying to win customers against. So the second topic that I would like to cover is how you measure performance. And, you know, there's a lot of different tools out there. One of the ones that we love, uh, if you're not aware of it, is this, you know, Google's uh, scorecard impact calculator. It will actually work out a financial impact of improving your site performance based on your own specific site metrics, like the visitors and the conversion rate and so on and so forth. So a really great tool that you can use to, you know, answer the question about, is it worth it, right? What am I gonna gain if I, shave one or two seconds off the performance time for my website. Aside from that, there's also a number of front end performance tools, which people are generally familiar with. So Google PageSpeed Insights, Web Page Test, you know, there's a bunch of different ones out there, but these then allow you to measure what's happening when pages are rendered to the user. And, you know, quite often these tools will give you suggestions for, uh, you know, how you can optimize and improve your site to make it faster as well. So super useful tools. <coughs> a couple of things that people aren't as familiar with perhaps because they're more kind of tech tools and you know i'm not going to get into the weeds on on any of this stuff but um you know application performance is a super important area understanding what's happening on the back end of your site what's happening within the code what's happening within your application stack and there's some great tools out there like new relic that allow you to you know not only measure uh, performance, but also troubleshoot and quickly pinpoint performance bottlenecks and, you know, also uh, set thresholds for performance. So if the performance drops below a certain level, you can actually generate an alert via email or Slack or whatever. Um, really great tool. We actually uh, provide it as an option to our customers, but, you know, it's available directly and there's other tools out there like it in the market as well. Moving on to infrastructure performance again, this is maybe not considered so much or, or potentially only looked at when there's a problem, right? When customers are, you know, phoning up complaining that they're getting errors or, you know, that the site is slow. Um, monitoring infrastructure on an ongoing basis is also super important. So the way to think about this is you have to measure performance at each layer of the stack and you have to do it constantly. You know, you can't just do it when there's a problem because by then it's too late. You've lost money, you've lost orders, you've lost customers. And that's a good uh, segue. Sorry. Mark, just, I just had a question for you there, right? Sure. So you spoke about site performance, then there was mm -hmm. application performance, and then there was infrastructure, infrastructure. performance, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, site performance is pretty much whatever we see on the front end. Is that right? Mm -hmm. If you could just sort yep. of you know, also ex like, you know, quickly uh, describe, like, explain the difference between these three site versus uh, app versus yes, so, infra. So, so. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. So site is what people are seeing when they when a, a web page is rendered to them. Right. So mm -hmm. these tools will look at the process of a page downloading and being built and presented to the user. Hence, it's called front end because it's like what the, the user will, will see. It's the experience yeah. that they have. 
but behind that there's actually you know how efficient is the code how efficient is the application how efficient are plugins or modules that you're using around that uh, you know a badly written line of code can really slow a site down so application performance allows you to monitor from the back end from the application side like and the code side what's going on and and, and look at it through that lens you know these tools are typically used by developers they're not going to be used by marketers right but it's important that somebody within the business is using and owning them and then the final one is infrastructure performance so that's what's actually happening with your servers or your cloud servers um, mm -hmm. you know, depending on how you've got your infrastructure set up what's happening with your cpu what's happening with your storage um, so you know these can allow you to spot issues um, you know for example if your cpu is occasionally spiking up to you know 80 90 percent then you know that's going to be mm -hmm. causing performance issues that are going to represent themselves elsewhere so it's kind of like yeah. a jigsaw right <clears throat> by yeah. looking at it from different angles you can kind of figure out what's what's going on got it so for the first one i would call up i would call my front end team for the second mm -hmm. one i'll call my back end team and for the third yep. one i would call my cloud service provider is that yep. is that absolutely so, uh, that's a that's okay. a great snapshot. Yeah, great okay. summary. Perfect. Yeah, let's continue. <laughs> All right. Um, so, the, 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 this is a great segue into the, the, the concept I wanted to introduce called performance budgeting. So, performance budgeting, as I mentioned, it was something that Google introduced at our summit in Australia uh, last year. And, you know, I'll, I'll give you an analogy to kind of kick it off, right? So, you know, if we think of McDonald's and we think of a Big Mac, right, or some some consumable item like that, um, yeah, there is a price that you're willing to pay for that, and there is a time period that you're willing to wait for it, right? Um, so, if you had, um, you know, a Big Mac, and let's say it was, you know, five dollars, right? I I don't know what the the, the price, obviously, different in different regions, but you know, let's say a, a Big Mac's going to cost you you five dollars. Um, you know, if you said to somebody, hey, for that same five dollars, you know, McDonald's are going to offer you a completely custom built burger, right? You're going to be able to choose exactly the ingredients and the components that you want in it and what you don't want in it. And, you know, they're going to give you like, you know, gourmet, you know, burger and they're going to give you like, a, you know, freshly made bread and they're going to, you know, have a better quality control process around it so that they can make sure that the burger like, is put together properly and it's, it's, it's going to be fantastic. It's still going to cost you $5. Then that would sound pretty good, right? Yeah, but, I would love that. <laughs> yeah, you'd love that. Who wouldn't love that? Yeah. But, you know. If the consequence of that change is that people are queuing out the door of the McDonald's because it's taking, instead of a few seconds to make each burger, it's taking five minutes to make each burger. And, you know, you have to line up for like, you know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour to get to your burger. Suddenly that doesn't look such a good deal for that $5, right? Um, and, you know, McDonald's uh, is costing them more money as well. So, you know, maybe they're having to, you know, reduce their staff to keep their costs down and so on and that's making the whole situation worse so the reason i use this analogy is you know there's a trade-off you know between you know the quality of the product mm -hmm. that you get and how quickly you get it in most cases and the same is definitely the same true with our websites and digital experiences yeah does that make sense sorry does that make sense yeah absolutely it does right if it's uh, you know, uh fast has a cost to it yeah yeah, exactly. And, and this is the concept of performance budgeting is right. It, it acknowledges this trade off and it tries to force you to justify extra features against the performance overhead it creates. Right. So to do this, you need marketing from marketers, developers, product managers, leadership. You need to get everyone working together. Right. But if you implement it successfully, you can actually create a framework for making more sensible business decisions or more sensible digital decisions about how your site develops over time. Without this, what you tend to get is a situation where, you know, customers are demanding more and more marketers want to obviously make them happy and, uh, you know, reach more customers and deliver more features and functionality. And then the website just gets bloated and it just gets overloaded and there's no, there's no, you know, before you know it, it's taking 15 seconds to load and you've got this amazing site that everyone's bouncing off it because it's too slow, right? So it forces you to acknowledge and, and try and try and deal with that. Um, so, 
you know, it's not complicated. It can be simple, right? You agree a set of you know, parameters and you can obviously look at, if you're using a tool like the Relic or Application Performance, you can actually look at where your website's at now. And if it's taken five seconds to load, but you're getting reasonable ROI, you might say, well, you know what? Five seconds is pretty good. Like we're getting good ROI. We're going to set that's the slowest our site can be. That's our budget, five seconds. And any changes we make to our site can't make it any slower than that. Right. Otherwise, we have to make trade offs about maybe if I want to bring this feature in, maybe I need to change this or take this off. Um, so it might be, you know, it's got to be less than one meg or it's got to load under three seconds on 3G. Right. Whatever that that is, you've got to understand your audience, but try and put some definitions around, you know, those performance requirements. Make sense? Makes sense. You know, I, I love the concept of, you know, uh, if it's not worth waiting for, is it even valuable in the first place? Well, that's a very powerful framing or, 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 or a very powerful, you know, first, first, you know, first thinking principle, uh, which says, a great way to sort of filter down what are we building or not building. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, there's there's some resources on this that I've included at the bottom of this slide, as you can see, for people that want to dig into the concept in, in more detail. But as I said, there's different ways to look at it. You can set up different um you know, uh, parameters for different parts of your site. Maybe a marketing landing page, you need to be super fast because you're that's where your new users are coming in but maybe support pages, you know, maybe you can, you can have those slower because, you know, there are your existing customers, they're going there because they specifically want content they can only get from you and they're not going to go somewhere else, right? So you can, you can kind of think of it, you can get as complex or as simple as you want. You can also think about setting it in relation to your competitors, Right, so you know, if your site's loading slower than your competitors, they're going to get traffic that you're not getting. So maybe you can say, well, our benchmark is that we want to be at least 20% faster than our competitors at all times, and you know, we will make trade-offs, you know, on the functionality of our, our site or the features that we implement in order to make sure that we we achieve that. It's a simple simple concept, but really powerful. Yeah. <laughs> so. I'll move on to a little bit of an overview of, sort of some of the ways in which you can optimize performance through, you know, the different layers of the, of the stack. And again, I'll start with an analogy to try and, you know, uh, liven it up and, and, and make it easily understandable. Uh, but if I was to ask um, you, you know, you got two cars, one's a 1 1.6 litre, one's a 4.5 litres, which is faster. Um, what would your intrinsic answer to that question be? Any any uh, any answers on that one? I can I can say like I would. Point, four point five. Yeah, you'd yeah. say the four point five. Yeah, you'd probably yeah. say the four point five <laughs> is is probably faster than 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 a one point six, right? But you know, what if the one point six is a Formula One Ferrari and the four point five is Toyota Land Cruiser diesel, which right. is faster then? <laughs> okay, of the course, Ferrari, the Ferrari is faster. Is. Ferrari. Yeah. Okay. What if yeah. the race is a thousand kilometers long and you can't refuel? <laughs> so, so the answer is it really depends yeah that's the answer it really depends and there's a whole range of factors you know behind it and the same is absolutely true with site performance and you can't just focus on one of them you've got to consider all of them you know if you've got to carry four passengers versus one the ferrari is not going to be very useful to you and it's not going to win the race so you've got to think of all of these these parameters so to give you an example of of this um, you know, and, and one of the kind of things I'm very passionate about personally, because we see this in our interactions with people that are making inquiries with WP Engine all the time, is, um, you know, there's this obsession over server specs, right? That, you know, all mm -hmm. you need to do to make your site faster is get a bigger or a faster server. And, you know, it's so much more complicated than that. And that is so much not an apples to apples comparisons of, of other providers because of all of these other factors that I'm going to run through. Um, so an example um, to show this, uh, as I mentioned at the start, I'm a Liverpool fan. So this is a, a Liverpool fan site, Empire of the Cop. And down the bottom right hand corner, you can see a web page test, which is a performance result, um, you know, for that site. Um, so, you know, you can, I don't know if you can make out the numbers at the, at the bottom, but I'll walk through them. You can see that, uh, you know, the time to first bite 
where's that? Uh, time to first bite is one seconds. point. Is that right? No, oh, that's the fully point. loaded time. Yeah, fully yeah. loaded is sixteen yeah. seconds, but the first bite is one point seven seconds. So the initial response from the hosting platform that's serving up that first piece of content is one point seven seconds, but it's then taken seventeen seconds to load the whole thing. Right? Yeah, that so, seems like eternity in this age. It seems like eternity. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess this site can get away with it because us Liverpool fans are pretty loyal and we're going to stay on the site anyway. We're not going to bounce off and go to a Manchester United site, right? But you know, <laughs> the, point, the, the point is that um, you know, this, this 17 seconds is, is too long for most sites. But the initial response from you know, the person requesting the first piece of information to the website and the host and server responding to that is only 1.7 seconds. So what's happening between those two is all of the content on that home page is being downloaded and that's what's taking too long the site isn't optimized right like the images are too big or there's too many images or you know the the, the code is inefficient whatever whatever you know you can see some green and red lights on the web page test i won't get into those details but yeah the, the point i'm trying to make is you know typically with most customers there is far more scope for improving the speed of your website through optimizing the site from a code and from a um, you know, content perspective than there is through you know upgrading servers um, you know so you know another example is you know if you've got you know small car with a 1.1 liter engine you've got four big guys in it going up a hill it's going to go slowly right so yes you could put a bigger engine in and make it go faster but if three of the guys got out that's also going to help so you know you need to try and think of of it more holistically and as I say, there's optimizations that could be made at every layer of the stack. This is the good news, right? So there's lots of things that you can do um, before you even think about, you know, having to uh, you know, upgrade hardware or focusing on that as, as the problem. So let's start on the infrastructure side. So, you know, it's three big questions you need to ask. Where is your website hosted? How is it hosted? And what is it doing? You know, those th the answer to those questions is going to, um, you know, impact the, the performance that you get. So looking at the first one, where's your site hosted? Obviously, you know, it needs to be hosted close to your intended audience, right? So if you've discovered through web page, through your web um, stats, through your Google Analytics, that most of your users are coming to the site from the US, um, but, you know, your server is in, you know, Hong Kong, then that's not ideal for your customers, right? And some sites might have a lot of visits from different parts of the world, and they need to think about how they're going to deliver that content you know, to them locally. Um, but, you know, pretty simple concept. You want to make sure that your website is hosted as close as possible to where most of your audience are. Okay. You also want to understand how it's hosted. So this does get into the infrastructure piece, right? This is the, the, the one element that everyone kind of focuses on and obsesses on in, in most cases. Uh, but, you know, this is important. I'm not saying it's, it's unimportant. You know, you need to make sure you're with a provider that uses good quality infrastructure, that you're on infrastructure that is appropriately sized. Um, you know, but whether you're using on-premise versus cloud hosting and what the performance, you know, profile of that is, is, is also important. Not all infrastructure is, is created alike. And then the third thing is, what is your website doing? So there is a world of difference between a website that serves static images and content that doesn't change and a website that delivers, you know, uh, you know e-commerce capabilities or has, you know, membership, um, you know, functionality where people are logged in and retrieving information that's personalized to them. Because, you know, static content, I'll come on to caching later, but static content can be quickly served from caching layers. And you know, that minimizes the work that the underlying infrastructure has to do. Whereas a more dynamic site uh, that has to you know, interrogate the database to you know, process an e-commerce transaction or you know, work out what courses someone logging into a, 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 an LMS system is, is going to consume, that's far more intense. And those caching layers typically can't help uh, with that type of traffic. So, you know, one website with 50,000 visits a month may not perform the same as another website with 50,000 visits a month or require the same amount of infrastructure or hardware to power it. The second area where you can optimize is applications and the caching layer. So I mentioned this caching word before. 
um, you know, what is caching? A caching is basically just a buffer. You can think of it as a buffer that stores regularly accessed information so that rather than having to go back to the infrastructure and, and find that information and generate it every time, is it, it just serves it from the, from the buffer. And, you know, there's all sorts of caching out there in the world of our tech. Your, you know, your, your MacBook will do it if you've got a MacBook or any, you know, um, you know laptop, um, you know, mail does it right the post office is is basically like a, a, a cache um, and you know websites do it as well right and they do it with things like content delivery networks that save content in different locations so they can be quickly served to your users wherever they are and you know there's different types of caching that you can use um, the one that people typically use and i'm going to put a bit of wordpress context around that because that's obviously what we can speak about most most knowledgeably um, but you know plugin based caching is very easy to use right um, you know you just find a, a plugin that makes your server faster and like total cache or something on those lines and and away you go um, at the same time server level with caching is far more effective um, so the reason why is that anything that requires you to install a plugin on your site or requires traffic to come to your site before it can be actioned is ultimately putting more pressure on that server, on that infrastructure. So if you can push that work away from the server, put it in front, um, then it's going it's, it's gonna to be a far better experience. It's going to reduce the load on that server and it's going to reduce the number of requests that are hitting it. So this is super complex and nerdy and I'm not going to get into it, but um, it is complicated, right? There's multiple different layers at which you can and should apply caching in order to get a site performing well. And you know, most CMS platforms or content management systems um, do not do this out the box, right? So, you know, make sure that you're working with someone who understands this if you don't understand it. And, you know, that isn't always going to be a developer, right? Developers aren't always uh, going to be performance focused. They're going to be focused primarily on, uh, you know, building code and functionality. So, you know, make sure you're, you're working with experts that can help make sure you're set up in the most, most optimal way. As I mentioned, certain types of sites, particularly shopping and membership, bypass caching. So, you know, whereas with a brochureware site, um, on our platform, we would typically see 80% see of the requests to a brochureware site served from our caching layers. So that traffic wouldn't even hit our servers because it's being served from cache before it gets there. Um, with a shopping and membership site, you may only get 20% of that traffic being served from cache, which means 80% is actually hitting the server and the infrastructure. And hence, for the a traf a site with the same amount of traffic, you may need something four or five times more powerful to serve it because you're getting four or five times the number of requests actually hit the infrastructure itself. Does that make sense? I know that it's, it's a little bit complicated. No, actually, actually it does, right? Because uh, the fact that uh, uh, most of the content there is so dynamic in nature, right? It just sort of makes sense to, to get it uh, fresh uh, from the server directly. Is that a right interpretation? Yeah, if you, do, if you have to get something generated by the server directly, that server is doing work. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So anything that's dynamic basically forces the server to do work and that slows it down. Anything that's, yeah. that's um, not dynamic, that's static, that can be yeah. cached, um, can be served um, very quickly without uh, adding any additional load to the server. So it's far more efficient. Um, right. So this goes back to one of the point I was making at the start, whereas as the emerging consumers divide, demanding more and more dynamic experiences and sites, right. you know, that, mm -hmm. that is putting more and more pressure on performance because sites are driving more computational intensity. Correct. Correct. So, in fact, uh, you know, in general, right, uh, every site, every, you know, nature of uh, even like a, even your website for that matter, right, the website of WP Engine would look different to different people, right? Uh, yep. Or, you know, so no matter whether you are a subscription business or a shopping site or a content publication, right, uh, you would sort of, uh, you know, at some point in time, look at, you know, server level, you know, server level caching at some point in time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and as I say, it's, 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 it's a complicated area. So, you know, work with specialists that, you know, are going to understand this stuff because it's also changing all the time. 
right yeah. like anything in technology right it's constantly moving goalposts and and sites are changing all the time as well they're not static right people are updating yeah. them they're changing the functionality so you know this is why you know managing performance as a permanent ongoing process is so important you know it's it's so important that, that because uh, a lot of times uh, people assume that it's it's done once and then uh, and uh, people approach it as a project and uh, yep. wherein you know what at the moment we hit 95 on google page speed insights you know that's when they say job done right and that's when the Absolutely. project is you know parked aside but uh, the fact that it's just really a, a day in day out job right? uh, yeah <clears throat> So you either need a team that can, can manage this or you need to work with someone that's going to do it, do it for you. Uh, Google actually on that point presented a stat again at our summit when they talked about performance budgeting and they said that of sites that optimize for better performance that, you know, that taught, do it as a project, as you said, within six mm -hmm. months, 40% of them had regressed back to their original performance level. So within ah. six months, almost half had regressed back. Um, and that's because they weren't monitoring it and they weren't, you know, you know, they didn't have a framework around making sure that they sustained that level of performance as the site continued to change and evolve. Yeah, right. So, yeah, it, it is it is a full time job. All of a sudden now, simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I talked about Acacia. I mentioned CDN um, briefly, you know. Uh, for almost every site, um, you should use a CDN. It will cache copies of your content at points of presence close to your users. Um, and it will reduce overhead on your um, servers. So, um, you know, there's different types of um, CDN out there. Um, you know, full page CDNs are better than the static CDNs. Uh, they will cache do a better job of caching. Um, and in some cases, they can even cache some dynamic requests if they are you know, dynamic requests that are, you know, being generated, you know, in a consistent way or multiple times. Um, but for almost every site, you know, implementing a content delivery network is a good idea. And most of those web page test tools, the front end um, page test tools like web page test, that's one of the checks they will give. So they will give you a green or a red light as to whether you've got a CDN um, in place or not. Um, another thing which you can do, which makes sense, you know, uh, across the board is um, when you're using um, secure sockets, your so secure certificates, which everyone should be now, because otherwise you're going to get penalized by Google and, you know, your site isn't going to be secure. Um, you know, to have those SSL um, certificates terminated at the edge, not on your server. So, um, you know, Providers like Cloudflare, again, is a partner that's integrated into our platform. Uh, they allow you to do that. So, you know, essentially the, the handshake that a secure certificate does is done at the edge network, not done on your server. So, again, all these little things that you can do, you know, all add up, right? It's like, um, you know, if you think of a sales funnel, right? And everyone always says, if you can make a 5% improvement at, you know, five different layers of a sales funnel, you're going to get a 500% improvement in sales, right? All those little changes multiply out and, and really add up. Uh, using a fast DNS host is super important as well. So your DNS is basically translating, you know, your, your URL or your, um, you know, www.wpengine.com to an IP address. And you know, believe it or not, some DNS hosts are faster than others and by up to 150 milliseconds. And that website here will tell you, um, you know, how your DNS provider compares in terms of performance. So you can actually um, you know, have a look and make sure you have a, a nice fast uh, DNS. Cloudflare is, um, as I say, a partner of ours that we integrate with and, and yeah, we definitely recommend them. Um, finally, sort of front end, um, you know, performance optimizations and, and speed traps. So I'll, I'll cover a few of those. Um, there's some optimization plugins out there. Again, this is the WordPress specific context, but other CMSs work in similar ways um, that allow you to what's called minify, which basically reduce and concentrate uh, HTML and CSS. So basically what they do is they just squash all the amount of data that is being served um, to users and make it smaller, right? So if your so if the data is less, then it's going to be faster, right? It's as good as you know making your server bigger. So you know easy to use and a high high ROI. So again, things like WP Rocket, uh, EW, 
package optimizer, these you know, optimization plugins typically will make sense for most people. Um, images, I just spoke about one of those image optimizers, EWW image optimizer. There's a bunch of other ones out there, but um, you know, different file formats, different image file formats have different file sizes. And if you've got a home page, we see this all the time, where people have got uncompressed images or images saved in inefficient file formats like animated GIF, then that's going to have an impact on your site performance and it's going to lead to results uh, like, you know, I shared earlier with the Empire of the Cops site where you've got 17 seconds to load it. You optimized. Um, so, you know, you've got to ask a question, do you really need a, a 4K by 3K hero image at 300 PPI on a, on a website, right? You know, think about what you actually need and don't uh, upload images that are bigger and heavier than they need to be. Yeah. So again, there's tools and plugins that, that do that for you. Um, work with an expert if you're not. Another area where we see people often neglecting free gains to performance is simply not running on the latest version of PHP. All right, so 45% mm -hmm. of the web still uses PHP 5. As you can see from that graph, every version of PHP is faster than the previous one. And it's just a free boost. Right, all you've got to do is upgrade to the latest version of PHP. You've got to make sure your website's compatible, and we've got a compatibility checker in the WordPress repository that people can use. It's freely available to anyone. You don't have to be a WP Engine customer. Just search for PHP um, compatibility checker. But um, you know, you you know, really should take advantage of this because it's just such a simple no-brainer. Right. <clears throat> And another one is just offloading assets that you're not using um, or that aren't a core part of your, you know, um, content uh, man management system or don't need to be there. So, <coughs> excuse me, obvious ones are things like videos. You know, use something like YouTube or Brightcove. Use a third-party platform for serving that stuff. They're designed specifically for that purpose. Same with audio files. Anything that you can get off your server and onto a third-party platform is going to help improve the performance of your site. Okay. Yeah. So uh, on that, on the previous one, right? Um, yeah. There are there are dozens and dozens of uh, you know video players out there, or video hosting providers out there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you've obviously picked up uh, the most famous and the most uh, reliable ones, right? Uh, how should somebody be, you know, uh, choosing, uh, you know, making this choice? Because uh, it becomes a tricky call when they're sort of looking at additional functionalities from some of these you know, video players. Right? For example, Mistia goes beyond just hosting your videos. They also help you do the generation using videos. Right? Mm -hmm. YouTube also helps you play ads and so on and so forth. Right? But these yeah. are, you know, very, very straightforward uh, choices to be made there are uh, every player is sort of you know now trying to you know, build its own uh, you know usp by saying okay you know what we will serve ads and we'll help you monetize or we'll do something x you know we'll do something x and y and z right um, mm -hmm. when, when when we sort of uh, pick up you know one of these platforms right how should we sort of go about you know what's that decision making criteria for this yeah, I mean, uh, I think I think one of the things that's often missed, and look, you know, we're not we don't have affiliations with video serving platforms, right? That's it's really a business decision based on the you know functionality requirements and, and strategy of the of the you know the site owner. Um, yeah. You know, one thing that we see that people often um, don't do is consider their the long term roadmap for their site. Right, so you know, changing providers is you know is is work, right? It's time. Mm. It's um, you know time spent you know in evaluating different options and getting agreements in place and doing a technical change to your site and so on. Um, so you know, we I guess we would always encourage people to you know try and think of something that's going to serve them you know for the long haul. You know, don't just pick the first plugin that's going to serve your immediate, you know, the first tool or platform that's going to serve your immediate right, need right now. Think about what you might need in six or 12 months or two years in the future, um, because yeah. probably your site is going to change and evolve and you want to be with a platform that's going to support that. For some businesses, it might be appropriate to have ads in their video content. For others, it might not. Uh, 
partner is going to have you know better information to make an informed decision than you know than we would be able to advise as a as a wordpress platform provider yeah makes sense okay <clears throat> yeah. um another um area where people can improve I, I, we've put here start with blocks instead of themes so wordpress 5 has a new visual page editor to, called gutenberg um you know it uses visual blocks that are reusable so makes the process of creating um content a lot easier and a lot more um you know structured um and you know enables you to you know build sites easily without necessarily using a uh, a full theme and the issue with themes is that you know particularly free themes which we'd urge people to you know steer clear of um, they often come with bloated functionality and content that's not required so you know if you think about someone that's building a free theme they're trying to cater for a wide right. audience right they want as many people as possible to to, to use it and therefore they're typically going to have a lot of different stuff in there some of which you don't need and therefore you know if you've got a bloated theme you're straight away starting away with a, a performance hit on your site so if you can actually build your site without you know a theme or if you do have to use a theme use a theme that is designed specifically for the business that you're in right so if you're real estate or publishing try and use a theme that's built for that so it doesn't have anything superfluous and so that it runs as efficiently as possible for your specific business make sense you know what this is such a sensitive topic i think it could be <laughs> a standalone webinar in itself because it could be yeah, because the amount of bloatware that's available with some of the themes, and uh, if you pick up the wrong thing, if you have a one-page website and you pick up a full-blown visual builder for that, it just adds unnecessary load, right? And it makes it so inefficient. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and I'm not saying there's never a place for themes. I mean, we provide access to studio press themes to our customers and, you know, there's some fantastic themes in there. Um, yeah. but I guess, you know, definitely a minimum steer clear of anything that is not built, you know, for your type of business specifically, um, cause it's probably bloated. It's probably got stuff in there that you don't need. It's probably going to give you a performance tax, but you're right. True. A lot of these topics could be, you know, talks of their own for you know 45 minutes or or more <laughs> um but being frugal with plugins from a wordpress perspective and again most other cms's you want to you want to minimize you know the number that you're using uh you want to remove them when you're no longer using them critically um you know even if you're not using a plugin actively it's still leaving a footprint you know if it's installed so physically de-install de anything that you don't need yeah, best practice they say is less than 20, but it does depend on the efficiency of your plugins. And that's where a tool like New Relic, which looks at application performance, as I mentioned earlier, can really help because it's going to help you uh, identify how your plugins are performing. You know, there's a site called pippinsplugins.com that's got 86 plugins on it and it loads in like three or four seconds because they're all you know efficient you know plugins and the the, the site still re works really well whereas you might have 10 plugins but one of them's a real you know resource hog and your site goes slow so most important thing you know again have a monitoring place that allows you to quickly identify if something is having a big performance tax on your site including a plugin um avoid admin ajax like the play again quite a tech one but admin ajax uses patchy to dynamically render elements on a page that is incredibly resource intensive and impossible to cache so yeah again try everything that you can to you know uh, to, to avoid using it and um, encourage your developers equally to to do likewise um lazy load is 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 great um what it does is basically only loads initially what's being seen on your site so if you've got a page that's you know where people would normally scroll down you don't have to load the whole scrolled page um you know before you know in one go you can just load the bit that someone's going to see in their initial view and then load the rest when they scroll down and when they need to and again you know that's all about just being more efficient and not you know adding uh, work or downloading stuff that you don't need you know right now or may not need at all um, I know DB this is a, another you know relatively straightforward one that a lot of people miss so you know my SQL um, used by WordPress has a traditional uh, my ISAM uh, database engine but it's not 
very efficient. Uh, inodb, uh, if you can switch over to that, it locks off less of the data when accessing a table and makes it far faster. So if you've got a database, um, a site that you, you know, is with a big database that's used quite intensely, you know, this is going to give you a big boost if you're not doing it already. And finally, clean your database. Right, so you know, like anything over time, you know, like like your house or your car, you, know, you, you accumulate junk over a period of time, and you need to clean it out. So there's there's plugins out there like you know Advanced Database Cleaner that you can use to automate that process to make it easier to clean out stuff that you no longer need. WP Sweep is another one. Um, again, remember to deinstall those plugins once you've finished using them because you don't need to be installed all the time. And you know, there's a lot of content out there, but I'd like to kind of give an example of what success looks like, right? So, you know, obviously at WP Engine, with you know all of the customers that we support, with our focus on, you know, uh, being the unequivocal leader in performance for WordPress uh, sites and WordPress hosting, um, you know, we focused a lot of effort on constantly trying to improve performance over time, and this shows the average latency of one of our pods. Uh, over the course of 2019. And as you can see, it's gone down, you know, consistently over the course of the year, as we have, you know, constantly done, you know, PHP upgrades and, you know, all the different tweaks that we've done as technology evolves to try and constantly improve performance. So, you know, this is possible. And if you're going to deliver increasingly rich and more dynamic digital experiences to your customers, then, you know, you need to be you know, making up for that by, you know, doing everything that you can on the other side to try and help your site run more efficiently over time as well. Interestingly as well, we actually um, upgraded all of our customers to the latest uh, Google uh, instances um, called C2 instances uh, last year. Um, which are the latest um, generation of, uh, you know, processing technology, essentially. Um, you know, and that has a huge performance benefit, but this graph actually excludes that. So even without wow. that, you know, hardware upgrade that, that we were able to do to give our customers access to the latest hardware, we were still able to achieve, you know, a significant increase in, in performance over time. And there's a little blog article there that sort of talks through the things that we did over the year to, to achieve that as well, which might be useful for the audience. Interesting, yeah. So, sort of four key takeaways um, from my side. So, you know, first of all, obviously site performance has a huge impact on your digital effectiveness and competitiveness, and it does require constant monitoring. So make sure you've got a system in place, you know, to track it over time. Don't approach optimization as a, as a project because, you know, you will see in a lot of cases that those gains are eroded within six months, as, as we mentioned. Customers are becoming less tolerant at the same time as they're demanding more dynamic capabilities from our sites, right? So, you know, this challenge is getting bigger and bigger over time because of this, this trade-off. Uh, a performance budget is an awesome idea to set a framework for effective management of your performance and can also, you know, be used as a, as a competitive um, you know, strategy uh, against your competitors from an online perspective. And, and finally, you know, the one that's closest to my heart, you know, optimization isn't just a faster server, right? So, you know, infrastructure, application, caching, front end optimizations all require constant attention and there's big gains to be gained, you know, at every layer of the stack. Um, so, you know, if you don't have the expertise, you know, to, to be paying attention to this, just make sure you're working with someone that's a specialist, you know, on your technology stack uh, that can give you the right advice and support, you know, around this because it really will make a difference to the effectiveness and competitiveness of your your business and your digital um, strategy success right thank you so much for that mark this is very really interesting the the whole uh, you know uh, I, I think the last point really sort of, sort of takes it home uh, i do have a bunch of questions for you here in the chat let's okay. let's pick them up uh, yeah let me stop sharing all right yeah. Uh, the first question is uh, those websites serving more of dynamic content would not need reliable servers because using caching plugins won't help a lot. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I would say every uh, website needs a reliable server, 
right? Um, you know, if, if your customers can't access your site or Google can't crawl it, then, you know, you pretty much uh, stopped at, at, at stage one. Um, but, you know, definitely those sites that are serving more dynamic content, what they need is typically, again, all the other things being equal, they need bigger servers, right? If you're yeah. only if you're only serving 20% of your traffic from a cache, from all the caching layers, and 80% is having to go back to the servers and go back to the database and is having to create all that work on the server, then you're just going to need a bigger, more powerful server, you know, to do it. And you're going to have to make sure that you've done all the optimizations that we spoke about. Um, you know, whereas if you've got a static site, you can actually kind of get away with more right? Like you still want to be doing the optimizations. You still want to be giving the fastest performance to your users, but you know, caching, you know, will forgive a lot of, a lot of sins. And if 80% of your traffic is being served efficiently through, through cache, um, then you probably don't need, you know, that much um, power from your, your infrastructure and your server. Um, and that's another way to think about it, right? The more you invest in optimizing, the less you need to spend on your infrastructure. So, yeah. so those investments and that monitoring, you know, has a payoff, right? Like if you're not running yeah. efficiently, then you're burning dollars. Any which ways, yeah. So, so, so you will sort of obviously not only see more, you know, better side performance, but in the, in the long run, you'll obviously see a uh, you know, lot more savings as well, right? Yeah. Because infrastructure can actually balloon up very fast into a major yeah. cost center at times. Yeah. Or what you often see as well, and what we see a lot when we help customers, we bring customers onto our platform. Um, you know, on average, they see a 38% in performance improvement when they move over to our platform. And then you know, for our premium customers, we help them with the optimizations um, as well. And one of the things that we often see is after that optimization is complete and after they've seen that faster performance, actually they start getting more visitors to their site. And those visitors stay on their site for longer. So actually, you know, they may not see, um, they may actually still need the same amount of horsepower because the traffic and the demand has gone up. If Increases you've got a site automatically. That's, that's, yeah. yeah, exactly. Your bounce rate's gone down. Like you know, you've got a more successful site, right? That's a good thing. Yeah. Right? At yeah. the end of the day, like, you know, you get one or the other, you either get lower cost or you'll get more people engaged with your site. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I guess the point being uh, the incremental cost to serve a user successfully that is sort of what gets optimized essentially right exactly so you can serve yeah. a lot more users more happily more efficiently at the same cost right yeah it's a great way to put it fantastic yeah uh, i have one more question here right now which is uh, uh recommend any plugin that you would recommend for lazy loading specifically uh i believe this one called just called lazy loader um, okay. But um, look, what I'll, I'll happily have it, ask one of our engineers on that one. If uh, you've, you've got my LinkedIn detail on that slide, or you can email me at uh, mark.randall at wpengine.com, I'll, I'll happily uh, you know get an answer to that for you. But I believe there's one that's just called Lazy Loader. Okay, sweet. Uh, now I, I have one more question coming up here, which is so this is uh, something which was rolled out literally a few weeks back by Google. Uh, under the new banner called as Web Vitals, where they have sort of, uh, so Google introduced a bunch of new metrics. Uh, uh, I think uh, for the last two years, they've sort of tried to con capture UX as metrics, uh, you know, as, 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 as quantifiable metrics, like uh, FCP, and L FCP and LCP, FCP being the, the first content of paint, first content full paint, and, and then there's LCP, which is largest content full paint right mm -hmm. uh, so the question is is lcp something we should be focusing on right now uh, yeah yes um look i think it's fair to say that you know anything that you know google is investing in as a metric of site effectiveness for most businesses that are dependent or you know um you know gain from from google indexing should be paying attention to does that mean necessarily you should start 
you know, making mass changes to your site um, now, not necessarily, but, you know, with all of these things, you should, you know, either be very, keeping very close tracks of, you know, what Google is working on and focused on, or be working with a partner that can you know, help you interpret and understand that um, and, you know, evaluate, you know, what it means for your site, um, you know, to ensure that you are optimized in the way that Google wants you to be optimized. Interestingly, you know, you know, Google, this isn't as much of a black box as people say, right? Google actually publishes yeah. very clear guidelines about what they expect. So really, yeah. you know, use the Think with Google resources, you know, make sure you're doing what they ask you to do. Um, and, you know, make sure that you're monitoring that on an ongoing basis. So, yeah, I wouldn't say necessarily like it's, again, it's context specific, what an individual business should or shouldn't do at this point in time. There's no single answer for everyone, but in yeah. the best general advice I can get is keep a close eye on what they're doing, you know, stay as close as possible to what they document as best practice. Um, and, you know, if you don't have the time and bandwidth to do that, make sure you're working with someone that can, can do it for you. Perfect, makes sense. Okay, uh, the next one, right? <clears throat> Since only 44% of millennials prefer personalization over privacy, how do you think this will affect the webmasters who are planning to invest, uh, who plan to heavily rely on site personalization in future? Okay. This is slightly meta as a question, but yeah. let's go with this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so look, I think, um, you know, 44% is half your audience, right? I don't think any marketer would want to ignore 44% 40, 40, 40 of, their, of their audience. So I would say it is important. Um, you know, the, the actual stat was that 44% of um, Gen Z would uh, happily give more personal information in order to receive a more personalized experience. Right, so what this is talking to is that they will happily give you data about themselves, but you better make sure you're using it to deliver something that's of value to them. You know, if you're going to fill out, you know, a bunch of information and a profile, you know, for them about who you are as a consumer, but then, you know, you go to their website and, you know, let's say it's a, a, a you know, e-commerce site selling clothing and, and I've given them all this information about me and I go onto the first page and I see, you know, women's shoes, then I'm not going to be very happy. Right, I've given yeah. all this information about me and you're not adapting to it. So, you know, I think, you know, personalization is clearly um, something that is an increasing expectation with every generation. And Gen Z, you know, which is up to 22 years old currently, in the next five or 10 years are going to become the biggest consumer generation. And they have the highest expectations for personalization over every generation. So I think, you know, those investments are you know, right. I think they're ones that need to happen. Um, yeah. And, you know, very few people are doing it well at the moment outside of the obvious, you know, Amazon, Spotify, you know, Google, big, the big internet yeah. tech giants. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. All right. Yeah. You know, I think it's been, been just over time right now. But thank you so much for taking the time and, and answering these questions, Mark. Really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, we, yeah, I'm going to pause, uh, stop the recording now.